You know what you want. You can feel what you want. You are jealous of people that have it. You are pulled toward that thing that you want. And your doubt is blocking you by actively convincing you it will never happen for me. You think you're a bad person or you're unworthy or you're ugly or nobody likes you or how about this one? This was the story of my life. I have f***ed up my life so badly. I might as well just flush it down the toilet. I just wanted somebody to walk in and be like, Mal, you got, it's gonna be okay. You're afraid of getting rejected. You're afraid of disappointing somebody. When you feel like you don't belong, you immediately go into a protection mechanism. It starts as a way to protect yourself from mm -hmm. being rejected, but the truth is you develop a habit of f rejecting yourself. If you're hiding in plain sight, the people who are looking for you, can't find you. We're not gonna sit around and wait for motivation. We're not gonna wait for courage. You only have two choices. You either gotta figure out how to level up your confidence and start working toward it, or those dreams will haunt you. Start building it today. That is what will change your life. When you talk about personality, mm -hmm. so extroverts, introverts, a lot of us really, I know I did this, I was all wrong about what confidence meant. I thought confidence was a personality trait. Mm, I love this, tell me more. I thought that people that are outgoing are the confident ones, mm. right? And the truth is confidence is not a personality trait at all. It's a skill. And a lot of the extroverted people that you know are actually very insecure. I used to be one of them. I used to be the kind of bossy, crass, loud mouth that didn't believe in myself, that didn't believe in my ideas, that didn't have the confidence and the courage to really be the real me, right. who I am, who I'm not, flaws and all. There are a tremendous number of introverted people that feel uncomfortable uh, putting the attention on themselves, but they're very, very confident in their ideas. They definitely believe in themselves. And so when you start to separate confidence, not as a matter of personality, but as a skill that you can acquire because confidence is the ability to move, in my opinion, from thought to action. Mm. Because when you're a confident person, you believe enough in yourself and your capabilities that you're willing to try, that you're willing to share. To me, confidence isn't the assuredness that it turns out, it's the willingness to try. And, and that was a huge insight for me. And, and what a lot of people don't know about me, although I, I share this on stage and I'm extremely open about this because this is a, a, a topic that's really important to me, is that the m single most profound use of the five second rule is mind control. And I say that as a lawyer, mm. I will tell you, you can use this stupid trick to cure yourself of anxiety. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that. So you struggled very profoundly mm -hmm. with anxiety. Mm -hmm. So walk us through like some nuts and bolts of how you use the five second rule. Because I think we're, so my hypothesis and the reason we founded Impact Theory is that the world is living through two pandemics. The pandemic of the body, which everybody understands because it's so visual. Yep. Being overweight, dying of um, diet related diseases such as diabetes and things like that. But because the second pandemic, the pandemic of the mind is invisible, um, people don't realize how pervasive um, a suicide is, and it's, yeah. I think it's a leading cause of death among young men. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and then that there are ways that they can go about attacking that and fixing the problem. So yeah. Yeah. walk us through that. Sure, I would love to. Um, so first of all, I literally have struggled with anxiety my entire life. And anxiety for this conversation, the way I define it, is it is the habit of worrying mm. spiraled out of control. You know, you may say that you are a worrier. That's not true. You have a habit of worrying. A habit is a pattern of behavior or thinking that you repeat without realizing it. So anxiety happens when that pattern of worrying about things spirals out of control and now it starts to marry and manifest itself with physical sensations too. Mm -hmm. That's all that it is. I know that I say that's all that it is. <laughs> Me personally, I struggled with anxiety, uh, I think my entire life. It became quite acute when I was in my late teens and early 20s. I became medicated in the middle of law school. I took Zoloft for two decades. When our first daughter was born, who is now 17, the postpartum depression and the cascading panic was so terrible that not only was I medicated and couldn't breastfeed, but I couldn't be left alone with her. 
Wow. So when I say you can cure yourself of anxiety, I don't say that lightly. Mm. Four years ago, after I had been using the five second rule to change my behavior, how I spoke to my husband, how I negotiate in business meetings, how I conduct sales, the kind of parent that I am, my health habits, my eating habits, curbing the drinking. Um, I thought, I wonder if I can use this five, four, three, two, one thing to get control of my thought patterns. Mm. Not my behavior patterns, my thought patterns. Yes, you can. Wow. So we're going we're gonna to build this conversation because I want to start with something we can all uh, relate to, and that is how do you stop worrying and how do you stop listening to self-doubt? This is how you're going to do it. So all day long, you're going to have moments where your thoughts drift, and I use that word on purpose because for me, there is a physical sensation when you start to use the five-second rule and you start to wake up. Mm. Not only on time in the morning, but you wake up to your life and the opportunities in your life. There's your thoughts drift. Like you'll just be hanging out with your friends and then suddenly you're like, I'm not sure that that person likes me anymore. <laughs> you know, I haven't heard from my kids lately. I wonder if they're dead or, you know, oh, you know, is what like, check like you just start worrying about stuff. Mm. Why? Because it's a habit. Because when you're not paying attention, your brain shifts from you being a decision maker and paying attention to you just kind of spinning things on autopilot and one of your habits is worrying. The second you wake up and you notice, holy cow, I'm talking some negative garbage to myself right now. Mm. Five, four, three, two, one. You've just shifted the part of the brain that you're using. You've shifted from the basal ganglia, which is where your habit loops are spinning, and you've awakened your prefrontal cortex. You've also interrupted that pattern. Now what you're going to do, because your mind is actually ready to receive a different thought because of the counting, now you can put in an anchor thought. Like if you have a mantra, if you've got a vision about the way that your business is gonna turn out in five years, if you just have a thought that makes you really happy and proud, insert that. Now, why does this work? It works because of the counting. And I'm not kidding. We know, based on research, that positive thinking alone, not effective. In some instances, trying to force yourself to think positive can actually make the worries worse. Why? Well, the reason why is because it's really hard to just change the channel. What we have to do first is basically interrupt it and turn off the TV and then turn it back on with the prefrontal cortex awakened. So the counting is essential. And so you can start using this today. You catch yourself talking garbage to yourself because we all know if I were to put a speaker on your head and broadcast it, you'd be sitting here in the audience, you'd be in an insane asylum because the crap that you say to yourself is insane. And the problem is we listen to it. You'll be, you'll be in a sales meeting and you'll be undermining yourself. They're not gonna buy, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. You're not even present. Five, four, three, two, one, switch it back. Get back to that vision that you have about toasting your success or this customer being really happy or you being proud of yourself. Mm. Whatever that vision may be, you can control your thoughts. And this is not just us talking about it. This is a tool that you can use. So let's take it a step further. So worrying, if you let it go unchecked, what will happen is you will get used to worrying you will get used to living in a state where you're slightly agitated all the time. Let me talk a little bit about agitation. So what we know based on research is that physically, in your body, so physiologically, being excited is the exact same thing as being afraid. Let me say that again, because it is so important. In your body, being excited is the exact same thing as being afraid. Your body doesn't know the damn difference. Your heart oh, races, heart rate, your armpits right. sweat, you're like, you know, you may get tight in your throat. You may, your cheeks may get pink like I do when I get excited. The only difference between excitement and fear is what your brain says. And the problem is if you have a habit of worrying, guess what you're gonna tell yourself is going on? That you're, that you're like freaking out that you're not excited, that something must be wrong. Oh gosh, why would you say something's wrong? Because you got a habit of saying that all the time. Even as I became a, a speaker for a living or I'd be on CNN, when I first started doing it, I would be freaking out backstage. 
But even even though, like you know, just a couple, just last week, he's standing backstage, about to go on, eight thousand people, heart races, armpit sweat. Mm. You know, my hands get clammy. I'm not nervous though, not at all. I'm excited. And so I developed this technique and research uh, out of Harvard, not based on my technique, but something very similar, proves that if you basically, right before you're about to do something, take a test, run a race, public speaking, a business negotiation, ask somebody to marry you, whatever it may be that gets your heart racing, just do this. Go, I'm excited. I'm excited to give that speech. I'm excited to ask him or her. I'm excited to do this race. I'm excited. Because what happens is you give your brain context so your brain doesn't escalate the stuff going on mm. in your body. Your brain's not worried. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can combine this with the five second rule. So we know how to do worrying. You, ca you catch your thoughts drift, five, four, three, two, one, anchor thought. If you start to feel your heart racing, five, four, three, two, one, to awaken the prefrontal cortex, and then start going, I'm really excited to do this. I'm really excited to do this. Another technique that you can use is ask, um, I think they call it interrog interrogatory questions, mm -hmm. where instead of giving yourself a pep talk, say, well, why am I ready to do this? Why am I ready? Because that'll force you to answer the question, which then convinces you. Mm -hmm. So why am I ready to close the sale? Why am I ready to give this speech? Why am I ready? So those are two strategies that you can use backed by science that are proven to actually make your performance be much better. Now let's take it a step further to anxiety. So anxiety is what happens when the habit of worrying spins out of control, your body gets really agitated, and then you allow your mind to escalate it mm. into a full-blown panic attack. So for those of you that have not had the pleasure of having a panic attack, <laughs> Let me um, explain what it's like. So have you ever been in your car and you're driving down the road and you go to change lanes and all of a sudden there's like, oh my God, there's a car right there, yeah. right? And you swerve a little bit and then your heart's like and you may sweat a little bit and, and you grip the wheel really tight and you're super locked in on, on the road ahead of you. Mm. But then that car pulls away and the, the, the near miss scenario passes and your mind starts going, okay, you're all right now. Right. You're all right now, that's it. That's all, that's what a panic attack is, only it happens while you're standing in front of your coffee pot. <laughs> Seriously, you have that same, oh my God, way behind that. And your heart's racing and, and the problem for your brain is that your brain can't look around and say, holy cow, we almost got hit by a car. Right. Your brain's saying, what the hell is wrong with her? She's making coffee and she's freaking out. And so now your brain has a problem because what's your brain's job? It's designed to protect you. Mm. So your brain will now do whatever it can to magnify the problem. Remember we talked about the spotlight effect? It'll start telling you all kinds of crazy stuff because it can't figure out contextually what the hell's going on. She's just making coffee, now her heart is racing and she's breathing really. Holy cow, maybe she is having a heart attack. Mm. A lot of people that have panic attacks say, I think I'm dying, oh my God, what's, what's happening? Wow. Or you'll see them do the deer in the headlights thing where they gotta get out of the room. That is the spotlight effect in your brain, now taking control and magnifying everything to get you out of whatever it was. So here's how you use the five second rule. You use it to stabilize your thoughts before the panic escalates. And then what happens is it drifts into worry and then it disappears. Right. So the second you feel worry, you catch it, you train yourself to do that. If you start feeling yourself getting, you know, your heart racing, you can five, four, three, two, one and use the I'm excited, I'm excited. Um, if you, if that doesn't work, literally five, four, three, two, one, and just give yourself an anchor thought, literally, of you being okay. This is a great story about a bunch of topics. It's a story about confidence. It's a story about being comfortable in your own skin. It's a story about being yourself, no matter where you are or what you're doing. And it's a story about the power of your unique self-expression and your unique self-expression comes out and is amplified when you feel comfortable in your own skin. I got into the speaking business, gosh, six or seven years ago. I had a TEDx talk that went crazy viral. That's what started the speaking business. And when I first got into the speaking business, I was really intimidated because I was new to it. 
and I wanted to do a very good job and I wanted to fit in. So I looked around at what all the top people in the industry of uh, motivational speaking and speaking on the corporate circuit were doing. And I noticed that all the women uh, were dressed in heels, wearing pencil skirts or beautiful dresses, the kind of thing that you might see a news anchor wearing, like a nice dress, heels. So I just wore what everybody else was wearing. Didn't even occur to me to wear something else because here I am trying to break into a new industry. So I look at everybody at the top, I copy what they're doing, and I am not comfortable in high heels. Yes, if my husband Chris and I are going out on date night, I can rock them like the best of them. But walking through a convention center in them, standing on a stage for an hour in a pair of heels while you're trying to hold in your stomach because you're being broadcast on a big screen and you're wearing a, a dress, like it was the least comfortable outfit I could possibly wear, very self-conscious in it. I'm not that graceful in a pair of heels. So I sort of like, poof, poof, poof on a stage, but that's what I did for the first couple of years. So I was in Miami. This must have been probably five years ago. I was in Miami and I had just gotten off stage, take off the heels, take off the dress, put on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. I got like an hour to kill before I have to leave for the airport. I'm gonna to fly to Vegas because I've got a speech in Vegas the next morning. So I'm walking uh, down Collins Ave in South Beach in Miami. And I walk past this store. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. I loved this store. And there in the window were the most amazing high top sneakers I had ever seen in my entire life. I was like a moth to the flame. Let me show you these bad boys because these are the originals. This right here, notice the gold shimmery sparkle and the confident blaze orange. I didn't own anything like this. I'd never seen anything like this. I immediately thought, whoa, this, I bet is what like a Justin Bieber kind of wears. I mean, these are insanely cool. I went inside and they were pretty expensive. I'd never spent that kind of my, I wasn't a sneaker head yet. But I thought, hey, I, I, I spend that kind of money on a pair of nice heels, so why not treat myself to a pair of sneakers, okay? So I get back to the hotel, I pack up, I hop the flight, I get to Vegas. Now, I wake up the next morning and I have a tech check, which is where you rehearse the speech and go through like all the technology rehearsals before the event's starting. My tech check is at 7.30, the doors to the event open at eight, and I'm on stage at 8.30. And I had a red dress, my heels, or so I thought. So I crack open, that's what I was planning on wearing. I crack open the suitcase, there are no heels. I have left the heels in the hotel room back in Miami. All I have are the Birkenstocks that I wore on the plane and I wore out in Vegas last night and my new Justin Bieber high top sneakers. And I have exactly 15 minutes to get to the tech rehearsal and nothing else is open. So Birkenstocks, Justin Bieber, I think we'll go with the Justin Bieber sparkly high tops. I slapped those puppies on. I walked from my hotel room all the way through the casino floor, past all the restaurants and the shops to the convention center, which you know is like a two mile walk. I was so happy to be not only in my red dress, but more importantly, in my Justin Bieber sneakers because it was super comfortable to walk there that way. I get to the backstage area and for the first time in two years, something happened. And let me tell you what happened. One of the guys that was on the production crew turned and goes, ah, oh, cool sneakers. That was like the first time somebody in production had really acknowledged me for something other than the job in two years. So I was like, huh. And as I started walking toward the backstage area, everybody I passed, cool kicks. Oh, those are cool. Oh, those are cool. And I'm like, this is wild. Nobody's ever complimented on my, like this is like, people are, and so I did the tech rehearsal and then this was the moment of truth. When I walked out onto that stage, it was at the MGM arena and uh, there were like 5,000 real estate agents in the audience. I was there to deliver a speech for Remax. It was the first time I'd ever walked on a stage where I actually felt like myself. It was also the first time that I felt the audience kind of lean forward and go, oh, she seems kind of cool. But when you walk onto a stage in heels and a dress, you're like the authority and you're on a stage and you're talking at people. 
There's something about walking onto a stage or walking through life and having something fun that you're wearing that makes you relatable and interesting and real. And from that moment forward, I have never not worn sparkly sneakers for work. I wore them every day on my daytime talk show. I'm embarrassed to tell you that I probably have 20 pairs of these. I love, this is my favorite, these are my favorite, well, I love, these are my favorite because these are the originals, but I would say these are my second favorite because I like the low top, top and I love the blue. I love these, um, which have a big silver kind of thing. These are super comfortable. And I've got a bunch of these and these did not even come with sparkles. So I literally bought Swarovski crystals or whatever the hell they're called and got a glue gun out and put them on myself. If you're looking for sparkly sneakers, there's all kinds of them out there these days. It's the coolest thing in the world. The dazzled sneakers are a thing. Whether you go to DSW or Nordstrom's or Zappos or anywhere, you can find them. And so the moral of the story, the secret to confidence is being comfortable in your own skin. And the secret to being relatable and likable is being yourself and being comfortable in your own skin. And so whatever it is that gives you a little flair, whether it's a little pin on your jacket or a little flower in your pocket or sparkles on your sneakers or cool specs, you gotta like, you gotta, you gotta find the confidence to bring that to the way that you go through life because there's something unique about you. And when you settle into what is really an expression for you, you feel comfortable in your own skin. And that's the greatest feeling in the world. When life suddenly changes and you feel like you have lost control and you start to feel stuck and powerless, how do you take control when you don't know where your life or the world or this moment is going? And here's the number one thing I want you to know. You don't need to know where this moment or where the world is going. You just need to know where you are going next. And one of the things that has happened, uh, certainly in the pandemic, but it always happens when there's any kind of reckoning in your life, is that when you have something suddenly happen and your life is fundamentally changed, whether it's a death, or somebody says, I don't love you anymore, or you're fired, or you find yourself uh, with a scary health diagnosis, there is a line in the sand. There is a life before that happened and then a life after that moment happened. And that line in the sand, that reckoning that happens, and it happens for all of us, whether it's happening for you right now or it has happened in the past, I'm telling you, there is a gift inside of this even the darkest moments, because every single sudden change in your life that makes you feel like you've lost control and you no longer know where you're going, it's like hitting the giant pause button. And if you lean into the moment, there is a chance for tremendous wisdom and growth. There are things that you can do right now in order to take control of where you're going of what you're thinking about. And you can start to take this moment of change and you can use it to be able to take and make an intentional pivot in the direction that is meant for you next. And one of the things I wanna say about this moment is look, if you're losing loved ones, you are terrified, this has made you lose your job, you feel like you're in that moment where everything, you know, you're falling off a cliff, you're trying to pack a parachute, you're grieving. And so you gotta give yourself space to grieve the losses that you're feeling. And when you get a little bit of distance from the grieving and the ways of grief and fear that you're feeling start to space out, they don't ever leave you, but over time, those waves of, holy cow, and I don't want this, and I can't handle this, and why is this happening to me? Time will start to lessen those waves. You will gather your feet underneath you again, and you will absolutely be stronger and be a better version of yourself based on this incredible challenge that you're facing. 
And I can say that even though you may be facing in a tough time, because if you think about your life, you faced extraordinary challenges and there hasn't been a single one that hasn't made you a better and stronger version of yourself. And this moment will be no different. So I want you to understand that when you get out of the cycle of grief, this is an enormous reckoning, an enormous opportunity for you to hit the pause button and for you to start to ask yourself the question, what do I want my life to look like? Because I think too many of us are sitting here going, I can't wait for my life to get back to normal. I can't wait for this to end. I can't wait to things to go back to normal. And in any moment of reckoning, what happens is there's actually parts of your old life that you don't want to go back to. And there is a tremendous amount that you're learning in this moment that you need to pause and take in and say, okay, based on what I've just learned, based on my old life, when I look ahead to my new life, what is it that I want my new life to look like? This next chapter, I can turn to a blank page, I can take all this wisdom, all this resilience, all this strength, and I can write something new. That's what I want you to know. You don't need to know where the world or where everything is headed. You just need to know where you're gonna head next. I believe with all of my heart and being that every man, woman, child, person, grandparent, everybody should infuse their days with habits of celebration and self-confidence. And the fastest and easiest and most science-backed way to quickly start to change how you see yourself is by adopting a simple habit of high-fiving your reflection in the mirror every single morning. Now, I know exactly what you're thinking. Are you serious, Mel Robbins? That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I know, I know, I know it sounds dumb. But the reason why your first instinct when you think about waking up, whether you're in your robe or your underwear, or your PJs or your birthday suit and walking into that bathroom and having a moment with yourself and raising your hand and high-fiving yourself is because your self-confidence is in the gutter. You believe some garbage about yourself. You think you're a bad person or you're unworthy or you're ugly or nobody likes you or how about this one? This was the story of my life. I have f***ed up my life so badly I might as well just flush it down the toilet. You have some narrative in your mind that is so negative that when you look in the mirror, you see somebody worth trashing. You see what's wrong. You pick apart your appearance. And I wanna reverse that because here's the deal about self-confidence. Self-confidence begins with you. You realize the word self is in there, right? I can't give you confidence. I can give you a little boost. I can give you tools, I can encourage you, but confidence is forged in fire. It's something that's within you. And here's the thing I want you to realize about confidence. You are a confident person. That's why you miss feeling that way. You can only miss what you know. You've just been blocked from the feeling of it. And wherever you are right now in your life, I'm telling you, confidence is in there. You just got to figure out how to tap into it. And you've been building confidence all along, by the way. Every time that you have fallen on your face or you've tried something and failed or you've gone out and thought you found the love of your life and then your heart's broken and then you pick yourself up again and then you dust yourself, you're building confidence the entire time because confidence is not built on the high days. Confidence is built on the low ones. Confidence is built when you are struggling. Because when you see yourself go for something and fall, when you see yourself try and get knocked down, when you see yourself stand back up after getting abused or traumatized or discriminated against and moving ahead, you are building this reserve within yourself where you know you can rely on yourself. You know you can face hard things and you can keep moving forward. You know you have your own back. So it's in there. Your life has been helping you build it. Now you got to just dig in and tap into it and use it to shut that critic up in your head. So the way you're going to do that is every morning, I'm not kidding, you're going to raise your hand in the mirror and high five yourself. Look at how many people are doing this. You're not the only one. For five mornings in a row, I want you to high five yourself. And when you do this, I want you to use the hashtag 
high five challenge. You know what's happening when you raise your hand up in the mirror? You are taking the lifetime positive association that you have with cheering for other people, believing in other people, uh, celebrating other people, saying, let's go to other people. And you are marrying that positive association with your reflection. It is impossible to raise your hand in the mirror and go, I suck. You can't do it because your brain and the subconscious sees this and thinks, let's go. I love you. I believe in you. And when you do this every single morning, something incredible happens. First of all, you're not going to leave your bathroom feeling like you're dragging a boulder. You're going to leave there feeling like the wind's at your back. Secondly, you're going to have spent the morning, the first thing in the morning by taking a moment and being with yourself and not seeing your face and picking yourself apart, but actually seeing the person that's underneath the skin, the soul that's behind the face. You are going to shut the critic up. You're going to silence your to-do list. And when you raise your hand like this, it also prompts you to think about the game you're playing. So now you got a moment to be like, oh yeah, yay me, I'm still here. I can make today a good day. In fact, what game do I want to play today? Just for me. So that's the first thing that you're going to do. You're going to high five yourself, take the high five challenge, which is high five yourself five days in a row in the mirror, take a photo of it, post it on your story, tag me so I can cheer for you and start to notice what happens. Something weird happens by day four, when you get out of bed, you're gonna have this weird feeling that you've never had. You're gonna feel like you're looking forward to seeing yourself in the mirror because something weird happens when you start to really be present with yourself. When you normally walk in the bathroom and you ignore yourself, you're alone. I think a lot of us feel like we're alone in our lives. When you start to see yourself, you literally, oh, hey, hi there, Mel Robbins. How you doing? You now, as you look forward, oh, hey, girl, how you doing? Hi, Mel Robbins. Oh, hey, let's go. I believe in you. Gonna have a great day. It's almost like when your neighbor waves to you, you're seeing yourself. You know, now that I've been doing this for a year, I don't feel like I'm alone. I feel like I've got myself and I've got my own back. I feel like this person that I see in the mirror is the one person that's gonna be with me for my entire life. So I better cheer for her. I better celebrate her. I better encourage her and love her. And that's what you're doing when you do this every morning to yourself. And there are mornings where I stand in my underwear at my bathroom sink and even I don't have a word to say to myself, but I can always do this and it always lifts my mood. And it is creating that deep connection within me to myself. And that's what builds your confidence. Confidence is being comfortable in your own skin. Confidence is knowing that you have your own back. Confidence is knowing that you can face something. Confidence is believing in your ability to face or survive or try something and be better. And confidence is being willing to try. And all of those things happen when you raise your hand every single morning. The second thing that you should do is, um, you gotta be honest with yourself. If there are things about your appearance that are within your control, whether it is the shape that you're in, whether it's the health choices that you're making, whether it's how you take care of yourself in terms of self-love, and you're not taking action in those areas, the lack of action says to your brain, you don't care about yourself. And so what I want you to do is pick one thing, one behavior that you could do every day. The high five's one of them, pick another one. And I want you to practice doing it. And it's a behavior. If you think about the person that you want to become, what's that person do every day that you don't do right now? And when you start to do the thing that the person you want to become is doing, you leverage something called behavioral activation therapy. And that is a whole body of research that says when you act like the person you want to become, it's the most powerful way to change a habit. It's even a uh, better therapy than uh, talk therapy because the action proves to your brain that you're becoming that person. You're seeing the change through the action. And so then the brain catches up and starts to relate to you like a person that's confident or a person who adores their appearance or a person that celebrates themselves exactly as they are. 
So try those two things. Make sure you tag me online when you do the high five challenge. And uh, I know it's going to work. There was this one morning where um, I walked into the bathroom and I was standing in my underwear, brushing my teeth in front of the mirror. And I looked up at the mirror and my first thought was, ugh. I noticed that my jowls were starting to look like saddlebags on a pack horse at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and uh, I had like these crazy lines by my eyes and my neck was really like kind of saggy and one boob was hanging lower than the other and my gray hair was coming in and I, and as soon as I started kind of critiquing my thoughts or my, my looks and appearance, then my mind rich started going, fuck, I didn't get that email back to that person. And I got that presentation I need to do. And my God, did that speech just cancel again? What the fuck am I going to do? And I look down and the dog needs to be walked. And then I think I, I got a zoom call in nine minutes. Like I got to get my shit. Again. And before I knew it, my whole mood was low. I felt overwhelmed. I had taken myself down mentally. I just wanted somebody to walk in and be like, Mel, you got, it's going to be okay. Like you got this girl, like mm -hmm. it's lift your head up. You can handle this. I don't know what came over me, Rich. This is pathetic. But standing there in my underwear in front of my bathroom sink, I raise my hand and high five my reflection. And I cracked a smile because it's so fucking corny. I even thought of that guy, Stuart Smiley from the SNL skit. Mm -hmm. So remember that I'm nice, I'm kind, yeah. people like me. Went on with my day. That was it. Snapped a photo though. No, not that one. Oh, not that one. Mm -mm. Not the first time. And then I kept doing it. I did it probably for a week or two. And here's the weird thing about it. I started when I woke up after doing this high five your own reflection in the mirror thing, I actually started to feel like I was looking forward to it. And here's why. You know, I've spent a lifetime just like you standing in front of the mirror. And what I realize now is that when I'm standing in front of a mirror, I'm either critiquing mm -hmm. or picking myself apart or I'm ignoring myself. And when you start to high five your own reflection, it starts to build a partnership within you with yourself. When you walk into the bathroom and you see your reflection and you've been greeting it, it's like seeing another person. It's the strangest thing. You start to realize how often you fucking ignore or destroy yourself when you see yourself or beat yourself up. And here's what's also crazy. You have a lifetime positive association with high-fiving other people. Mm -hmm. Sure. As a runner, as a racer, you have gotten so many high fives, Rich. What does a high five say to you when somebody gives you one? You feel seen, you feel appreciated, you feel energized by it. And it's, a, it's an exchange of energy. It's not the same, and you talk about this in the book, it's not the same as like self-talk because there's a participation involved in it. There's like a communion yes. aspect to it. Yeah, and you know, if you think about it, you're so good at celebrating, seeing, and cheering for other people in your life. You plan birthday parties, you reach out to people when you're worried about them, you help out colleagues, you cheer for your favorite sports teams, you high five people like Rich as they're running races past you, you buy people's merchandise, you do all kinds of stuff for other people, but nobody's taught you how to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. In fact, the reason why it feels and weird to high five your own reflection is because you've been taught to do the opposite. Why is the default to just beat ourselves down like that? I mean, it is crazy. We would never treat anyone else in our lives, especially the people we care about, the way that we treat ourselves in terms of the self-talk or the narrative or the critique or the, you know, the, the, the kind of harshness with which we, you know, judge our appearances, our behavior, the way we you know, think back on things that we said the other day and just are horrified by our own selves. And it's, I don't know if it's everybody. But everybody. It's most people. Except for Buddhists. I mean, I yeah. think that they're like, like if you're a big practicing Buddhist, that's a monk. Right. That's like just Why kind can't of, the default be the good things though? Well, you I- know, Why yeah, is it wired that way? You know why? There's, a, there's cognitive bias. There's a, there's a bias towards mm -hmm. negativity. 
Uh, and it's a protection mechanism that's a default from evolution, that if you remember the bad sh you're more likely to spot it when it happens in right. the future. So you can avoid it. And here's where I think it begins. I believe my theory is that it begins two places. Either you, or that could be both actually, you either learned the pattern of beating yourself up because you had parents or caregivers that were hard on themselves or hard on you. And so as a child, you absorb that pattern and you now repeat it and you don't even realize it. So those moments you're like, oh my God, I sound just like my dad or my mom. That is an example of a pattern that you've absorbed. Mm -hmm. So particularly for women, We've watched our mothers be critical about their appearance. We've watched our mothers ignore and criticize themselves in the mirror. And so we learn that from our caregivers. So that's one place. The second place that we learn it is when the drive in your life becomes fitting in. Fitting into groups in elementary, middle, high school, college, your neighborhood, that feels safe when you fit in. When you feel like you don't belong, you immediately go into a protection mechanism. And I believe a lot of the negative self-talk is a sorting hat type of mentality yeah. that we do to ourselves going, I can't be with those people. I can't be with those people. It's safe to be with those people. And you start to see yourself and the world around you as places where you belong and places where you don't. And part of the criticism, as fucked up as it sounds, that we engage in all the time is don't be too big, don't be too loud, don't show yourself too much, don't have blue hair, don't do this, other people won't like you. It starts as a way to protect yourself from mm -hmm. being rejected, but the truth is you develop a habit of fucking rejecting yourself. Right. Meanwhile, you're further divorcing yourself from who you truly are because you're not Correct. giving yourself permission to be yourself. That gets sublimated in favor of fitting in and, you know, accommodating other people and acclimating your behavior around what will be approved of. Yes. So for me, um, I, you know, I have clearly a lifetime of beating myself up and tearing myself down and regretting decisions that I made. And in the middle of stumbling through life, instead of being like, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Being like, you're really fucked up now, Mel. How does that help? Right. How does criticizing and, and being hard on yourself help? Confidence is a skill that you can build using simple, repetitive tasks and thinking tools. And you can start building it today. I want you to just settle in for a second, ground yourself in this moment. And I want you to think about what is something that you want to make happen this year in your life? What is the one thing that if, if Mel Robbins could wave her sparkly lip gloss and I could give you the next level of confidence, okay? What is that thing that you really wanna create in your life for real? And write it down. I see write a book, I see retire, I see uh, have 10 to 15 coaching clients, be a speaker, sell my art. All of it is achievable. How do I know that? Because somebody else in the world is doing it. If someone else in the world is doing what you dream of doing, you have evidence that it is possible for you. And here's what I know about your dreams. Your dreams are deeply personal. And when you have dreams that are deeply personal, that are meant for you, that pull you like an arrow is pulled towards a target, you only have two choices. You either got to figure out how to level up your confidence and start working toward it, or those dreams will haunt you. Because I personally believe, I'm writing a book about this right now, that when you're born, your dreams are woven into your DNA. They're preset. There is a life that is meant for you and your dreams are trying to pull you toward this. And what's super, super cool about getting in touch with your dreams when it relates to confidence is that, you know, your dreams are just things that you can achieve if you work toward them. And so if you're not working toward your dreams, if you don't have your dreams already achieved, here's what I know. There's something about you that is blocked right now, and that's okay. Thinking about your dreams will haunt you. Getting out of the thinking habit and into the action habit 
That is what will change your life. And so here's the next thing I want to do. I want you to now level up even more because I bet the way that you wrote your dreams down, I bet you even shrunk it a little. I bet your self-doubt and your insecurity made you write a dream that was a little bit smaller than what you actually want, right? I know this because I do the same damn thing to myself. Of course I do. You know, I, I, I think about, you know, what my big dreams are and I go, oh, well, you know, what do I really want? I want my next book to be a massive success. I want it to dominate the bestseller list for at least 10 weeks. That's my big, big, big dream. But what I say is, oh, I'd love to, you know, make the New York Times bestseller list. I shrink it because my self-doubt and my insecurity even starts to block me when I dream. You feel the pull of your dream, but then you say this to yourself, it will never happen for me. There's a relationship between confidence, which pushes you forward and self-doubt with blocks you. And this is why self-doubt is such a killer because you know what you want. You can feel what you want. You are jealous of people that have it. You are pulled toward that thing that you want. And your doubt is blocking you by actively convincing you it won't happen for you. So let's talk a little bit about confidence, okay? First of all, I've already said it's a skill. It doesn't matter if you were born the most insecure, thumb-sucking, abused, pathetic soul of a human being. You can build the skill of confidence. It doesn't matter if you came out of the womb super ego-driven and larger than life and confident and all that stuff. You still have a lot of work to do when it comes to confidence, authentic confidence. So let me talk to you about what is the skill of confidence. My definition of confidence is not belief in self. I love evidence-based advice because I'm kind of skeptical. I looked at the research on confidence, okay? And there's really good news here. The first thing you've already learned, it's a skill. The second thing that you are going to learn that's really good is it's, it's very simple to build the skill of confidence. And you can do it through repetitive actions every day, very simple little things that will slowly build up the reservoir of confidence. And here's the definition I want to give you of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. That's it. And the reason why I like this definition is because this definition is based in the research around confidence. So if you want to learn more about this, Google confidence competency loop. This is my fancy little graphic, okay? This is what we call a confidence competency loop. I did not invent this. This is something that people who research confidence for a living have created. And I've highlighted this because this is where confidence begins. It begins with the willingness to try, because I'm going to show you what ends up happening if you're the kind of person who trains yourself. Notice the words I'm using, trains. We're not going to sit around and wait for motivation. We're not going to wait for courage. We're going to manufacture those things. And this is where the five second rule is so transformative. All you do is in a moment where you feel doubt, insecurity, fear, anxiety, procrastination, perfectionism, PTSD, OCD, anything that you might possibly have that would rise up to block you, you simply count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, okay? And you gotta count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. And what that will do is it will shift gears in your mind. Instead of being stuck here, in the part of the brain that keeps you stuck worrying and thinking and having a bias towards overthinking and being a perfectionist, you're going to go one, four, or five, four, three, two, one, and you're going to try. The first time you try, you will fail. That's really good news. You want to know why? You learn by failing. Do you realize that's how you've always learned? That when you were a kid, you don't remember this, but when you were learning to walk, you fell an average of 17 times an hour. 
And so you learn everything when you fail, because when you fail, as much as you may think you're going to die, if you stand on a stage, I see a lot of you who want to be coaches or speakers or whatever, you're going to have to learn how to give a speech where you stutter and where your, your mouth gets really dry and pasty and where you get a neck rash and where you forget what you're supposed to say. You got to do all that stuff. Why? Because when you fail, you don't die. You actually gain knowledge and experience. And that's the gift of failure because you then take that knowledge and that experience and you go right back to the next time. And then you try again. But this time when you five, four, three, two, one, try, you're going to take your knowledge and experience with you and you're going to fail a little bit less. And what you're going to learn there, you're going to take right back to the next time that you try. You five, four, three, two, one, you push yourself to try. You gain a little bit of competency for the next time you're going to do it. And every time you gain a little bit of competency, your mastery goes up. And that's when you start to feel more self-assured. And that muscle, everybody, of trying, that is where you build the skill of confidence. What we're talking about is whether or not you're hiding in plain sight. Now, the reason why I want to talk to you about whether or not you're hiding in plain sight is because if you're not the real you, the people who are looking for you can't find you. I'm going to say that again. If you're not living your life, if you're not showing up at work, if you're not going through the process of dating and being the real you, the people who are looking for you can't find you. And the secret to life, and this is so hard to grasp is to just be yourself. That's the secret. There's only one you. There's only ever going to be one you. There's never going to be another you. And the way you make your mark in this world, the way that you learn how to believe in yourself, the way that you discover the people that you're supposed to surround yourself with, the job that you or career path that you're supposed to have, is by being the real you. And it's terrifying. I get it. I was a chameleon for a very long time. And when I say long time, I mean like the first 40 some years of my life. And what does it mean to be a chameleon? Being a chameleon means that you adapt to your surroundings and you blend in that you're scared to let the real you be seen. I mean, think about a chameleon. They hide in plain sight. And so if you are in a relationship like I used to be, I used to be in relationships and I wasn't even present. I was hiding in plain sight. I was a chameleon. If uh, you were somebody that I was dating and you liked the Grateful Dead, guess what I liked? I liked the Grateful Dead. If you liked to eat pizza, guess what I liked? I liked to eat pizza. If you like to sit around and watch uh, baseball for three and a half hours, guess what I like to do? Not really, but guess what I would do and pretend that I would like to you because I was so convinced that I was not a good person, that I was not likable. I was terrified of disappointing anybody. And it may be hard to believe that because you see me now, but this is how I live my life. And the problem with being a chameleon, and give me a thumbs up if you can relate to this, and here's another challenge I have for you. Let's come out of hiding right now. Tell me, confess to yourself, where is it in your life that you're hiding in plain sight right now? That the real you isn't present. Is it at work? Do you have ideas at work and you just show up and go through the motions and you don't put yourself or your best work out there? Are you hiding in plain sight because you're at a job that you can't stand? Are you hiding in plain sight because you're in a relationship and you know that the person that you're with has all of the power in your rela the relationship. You're scared of upsetting him or her. And so you stay quiet or you don't make the requests that you need to, to make. Are you hiding inside a body that's not truly who you are? That you're hiding in plain sight and underneath the body that you're in, whether you're way unhealthy, too skinny, or you're overweight and you know that that's not the real you, but you're hiding in plain sight because you're scared to be seen. This is a major issue 
for a lot of us. And when you think about the areas in your life where you are hiding in plain sight, and please, Tracy, if you see where people are giving me examples, or Audrey, let me hear some examples. Work, relationships. Work, relationships. In school, a lot. School, a lot. I bet in school, you maybe aren't taking classes or majoring in what you really care about. Maybe you're not um, asking questions because you're afraid to look stupid. Relationships, this is huge. And the reason why it's huge in relationships and where so many of you are hiding in plain sight is that you're afraid of getting rejected. You're afraid of disappointing somebody. You're afraid of rocking the boat. And so you don't. You just blend in like a chameleon does. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this is because, um, as many of you know, in addition to being a motivational speaker, and that's exactly why we're here in San Diego, in literally 20 minutes, I'm going to go downstairs at the hotel that we're in, and I'm going to be giving a keynote address um, talking about the five-second rule and the power of five-second decisions. In addition to being a motivational speaker, I am also an international best-selling author. I wrote the five-second rule. Um, which is the number one selling uh, self-published audiobook in the history of audiobooks. Very, very proud of that. The five second rule has been translated into 36 languages. And this is just in two years, you guys. And more importantly, um, we have gone on to partner with Audible and we put out what are called Audible Originals, which are audiobooks that you can listen to only on Audible. And they're all coaching programs. And so we launched one two, three weeks ago about. Uh, it'll be three weeks ago, I guess on Thursday, maybe, called Take Control of Your Life. It's so cool. It's 10 hours long. It's six coaching sessions. And in addition to listening to the coaching sessions where people talk about their greatest fear, and do you want to know what the greatest fear is for most of us? Being seen. We're so afraid to just be ourselves. And I think that the reason why is there is a hardwired need based on survival to be part of a pack that there is safety in a pack, that when you were little, you couldn't survive without your parents taking care of you when you were little, little, little. So it's part of our DNA to want to be accepted and to want to be connected. And when you were little, you start to realize when your parents are angry or when they're upset with you or when your mom's having a bad day or when your dad's in a bad mood and you start to maneuver those emotional landmines that were happening in your house, and most of us maneuver them by either staying quiet or getting out of the way or being so afraid that we're going to disappoint somebody or set them off that we become very small and silent. And the problem is, is that when you start doing that when you're little, you carry that into your adult life. And so if you're stuck in a pattern where you're constantly in relationships, where you're picking the wrong person, or you're in relationships where you don't have the courage to be yourself. You don't have the courage to say to your boyfriend or girlfriend, when I'm out with my friends, don't Snapchat me 35 times. Okay. It's controlling and manipulative and it's making me angry. When you text me and I don't text right back, stop giving me shade. Okay. When you keep bringing up the past as a way to manipulate me, it makes me feel bad. You don't even say that. You know what you do? You're a chameleon that hides in plain sight by shutting up. We all do it. And in fact, I was a master at this. I was a master at, of it, and I can trace it all the way back to a particular instance when I was in fourth grade. When I was in fourth grade, I was molested by another kid while I was sleeping on a family trip. We were on a big ski trip, and an older kid climbed on top of me, and I woke up in the middle of it. And um, that was not the part that traumatized me, as weird as it is to say that. Looking back and deconstructing the moment, I can tell you the part that actually changed the trajectory of my life. In the morning when I woke up, all the kids were getting ready for, to go skiing. And so I like hid under the covers because I didn't want to see this kid. And when I thought they were all gone, I, I got up and I went downstairs and my mom was cooking breakfast in the kitchen. And I thought all the kids had left. And my mom turned and said, oh, hi, um, how'd you sleep? And I was about to say what happened. And I turned and I saw the kids standing there ready to go out the door. And I paused and I became a, a chameleon. I hid in plain sight. I lied. I said, fine. I slept fine. And something happened in that moment. What happened is nothing. Nobody got upset. I didn't get in trouble. I didn't disrupt anything. I didn't create any waves. And in that moment, I learned 
that being a chameleon is how you deal with situations that scare you. It's how you make sure nobody's upset with you. It's how you stay with the pack. It's how you don't get in trouble. Not that I was going to get in trouble, but you know, this is how a fourth grader processes this stuff. And literally my version of being a chameleon was to lie. It was to walk into any situation and assess what was going to make me liked or make me accepted or make me popular or not upset somebody. And I just say that if you were a vegan, what did I have for lunch? I had a veggie burger. If you like the Grateful Dead, what did I like to listen to? I like the Grateful Dead. Hell, I even sewed one in the middle of my, I, I got a Grateful Dead patch in college because a lot of the kids I started hanging out with like the dead. You know what I did? I literally sewed a patch on the back of my jacket, a deadhead patch. How stupid is that? But I was a chameleon. I was hiding in plain sight. In fact, this carried on all the way through until I met Chris, who I've been with now, oh, 94, 25 years Chris and I have been together. God bless him. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> the first few moments that I met him, I lied to him. I'm not proud of that, but I was such a chameleon that the behavior, the pattern, it was so hardwired in my mind that I was trapped in it. I didn't even see it. So Chris is a huge outdoorsman. He started talking about skiing and about uh, hiking and about his experience with Knowles, and, which is the National Outdoor Leadership School. And I was immediately smitten. So what did I tell him? That I grew up fishing. That's true. But I grew up trolling, which basically means you stand in a boat and you drive the boat slow and you throw tackle overboard attached to a string and you hope you snag a fish. That's what trolling is. It's not truly fishing. It's more like trying to snag something. But fly fishing, now that's really cool. So I told him I grew up fly fishing because he asked me, oh, what kind of fishing? And I said, oh, 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 chameleon, hide and play and say it. I got a guy here that I really like and he's clearly an outdoorsman. So I'm going to say the cool thing instead of the true thing. I'm hide and play fly fishing. Now I tell this story in Take Control of Your Life because how was I supposed to know that Chris's best friend lived in Jackson Hole, Wyoming and was a fly fishing instructor and that I would find myself three months later on the bank of a river in Utah meeting his best friend and his wife for the first time where they pulled out to my surprise fly rods and I had to confess uh, to Chris inside our tent that night that I had no idea how to do it. And Chris, to his credit, laughed at me. I was mortified. And it wasn't until a couple years later when I remembered the incident in fourth grade that I put all the pieces together, that I could see the pattern, that I was a chameleon. I could see the reason why I constantly tried to blend in. But here's the thing you got to understand. If you're hiding in plain sight, the people who are looking for you can't find you. And so has it ever occurred to you that the reason why you're not happy in your job doesn't have anything to do with your job. It has to do with the fact that you're being a chameleon at work. You're hiding. And if the real work you were to show up, what I know is something different would happen. You would show up differently at work. That might lead to you leaving your job if you show up differently, or it might make your job more enjoyable. It might make everything shift. Same thing with relationships. You're never going to be in a fully committed, connected relationship if you're hiding in plain sight because you're not with the right person if you're not being yourself. If you don't have the courage to be everything that you are and everything that you're not, if you're a chameleon in your relationships, you're never going to find the person that you're supposed to be because the person you're supposed to find is yourself. And if you're constantly with people that you feel you need to hide your real self from, you're not with the right person. You're not with yourself. And so how do you fix this? Well, one of the things that you can do is because we talked about this extensively at uh, Take Control, the audio project that we just released. And, you know, here's the thing. You're going to have to address a pattern and a limiting belief that has become the default setting in your mind. I had to do the same thing. And in order to stop being a chameleon, in order to stop hiding in plain sight, in order to be fully seen for who you are and who you're not, you're going to have to confront the limiting belief that you're not enough. You're going to have to confront the limiting belief that you're not a good person. You're going to have to confront whatever garbage it is that you say to yourself that makes you hide because you have made the decision that you, all that you are and all that you're not, is not good enough. 
And so the thing about breaking the pattern of being a chameleon is that the moment that you start stepping out in the open, you start sharing yourself, you start pushing yourself to do things that are scary, you start drawing boundaries in relationships, you start leaving relationships where you feel like you must be a chameleon. You start leaving situations that make you feel like a chameleon. You stop yourself from lying and you tell the truth and then you brace for it. When you start to break the pattern of being a chameleon, something incredible happens. By acting in a way that you're willing to be seen and to be heard for who you are and who you're not, you're proving to yourself that you don't have to hide. And as things start to change in your life, the people that are toxic disappear, your work starts to align with who you truly are, what actually happens is all the right things start to find you because you're now open and able to be seen. So the things that are supposed to come to you, the right people, the right job, the right connections, the right even media and movies and books you're supposed to read, all of that stuff will magically start to appear because now you're out in the open attracting it. Chameleon, that term, it's also the same thing as being a people pleaser. That's what it really means. That all you, your whole mode is about making sure everybody around you is okay and taken care of and nobody's upset with you. That is classic chameleon behavior. Here's the other thing I want to say that's a giant disclaimer about being a people pleaser or being a chameleon. If you have suffered trauma, so you're a victim of domestic violence, you were abused as a child, you're a, uh, you, you've experienced a uh, sexual assault, you've been abused in some way, there's a big difference between PTSD and the things that you do to protect yourself because you've experienced legitimate trauma, not even legitimate trauma, you've experienced trauma yourself and being a people pleaser. And so it's important for you to also understand that if that's part of your past, it's essential that you go and you seek out some therapy to unpack all of that. Because what you may be stuck in is not sort of what I was doing, which is the lying and the people pleasing in order to fit in, but you may be stuck in a PS, PTSD pattern that's more about your survival and about the way that you get triggered when you feel threatened. And that's a really important distinction to make when you think about how you apply what I'm talking about to your own life. We need to stop asking questions and we need to be a leader in our own life. And we need to make decisions that support our family, that support our safety, and that support the things that we care about. And this all started to go down when um, we were still taping last week and Mindy made the decision to get rid of audiences. And there were tons of, of phone calls back and forth with our production company and with various people about, should we get rid of audiences? Should we not get rid of audiences? What are we doing? What are we not doing? Lots of questioning. I'm sure you're questioning right now. Do you know one of the biggest things that everybody's questioning right now, at least in my friend group, because I've got a 21 year old who's a junior in college a 19 year old who's a freshman in college and a soon to be 15 year old is everybody's been relating to self isolation. Like it's some big snow day. It's not. And so what everybody is asking each other in my friend group right now is the kids that are coming home from college, the kids that are home from high school, the kids that are home from middle school, should they be allowed to get together? Should they be on play dates right now? And here's the thing. First of all, I think absolutely not because self-isolation means you're protecting yourself and your family from all the people out there who you don't know who they've come in contact with. If these kids have come home on airplanes, if they've been on school buses, most of these kids don't have any symptoms. Self-isolation means you isolate yourself with your family. And so to me, the decision needs to be made because you can spend the next week questioning whether or not you should get a haircut, questioning whether or not you should let your friends come over, questioning whether or not you should get together with the neighbors. And what really needs to happen right now is you need to be able to make decisions that support you and your family. Because when you start making decisions, you move out of thinking and ruminating and stressing and feeling analysis paralysis. And the second you make a decision, 
sorry, kids, you're going to hate this, but no friends are coming over for two weeks because that's what the leading epidemiologists say. And as a family, we need to isolate. And if we isolate for a week and then we let a friend come in who's flown here from Texas, because that's where they go to college, who knows what they were exposed to on that plane? That's the point of isolation. Now, am I excited for the blowback when our kids are basically told you're stuck with mom and dad for two weeks? Nope, not excited for that at all. But in this moment in time, you really need to be making decisions because that's where the power is going to come. And the other thing is, is that your kids are going to be looking to you for certainty. And so here's the scope in which I am making decisions with my husband. What do we need to do as a family in order to keep ourselves safe? And what do we need to do as a family in order to keep ourselves positive? And what do we need to do as a family in order to change our routine every day to something new since we are in a very new and a very temporary moment of time where a new routine to the day helps all five of us in our family seize the opportunity that these next two to three weeks are. Because here's the other thing that I know. There's not a single challenge that you faced in your life that hasn't made you a stronger and better person. And there is no doubt that this is a challenging moment in time. Even if you're not in a hot spot, even if you're not in a country that is not quite in a lockdown yet, this is going to be a challenging time globally. If you listen to the experts, it's coming. And so on yesterday's broadcast, what I talked about are the three things that I want you to focus on. So I'm going to repeat them. And then I want you to um, write in the comments, where do you need to make a decision? Where are you questioning? And questioning what to do is causing you a lot of anxiety. And what decision are you going to make in order to uh, make a decision and take control of something that you're worried about, where you're gonna make a decision even though you know that your family members aren't gonna like it. You're gonna make a decision even though it means that you are maybe admitting to yourself, Jesus, this is ser serious. I guess I better stock up on some food. I haven't wanted to admit that. My parents are down in Florida right now. They're making a decision to go back to Michigan. They're not sick but they have been worried about what happens. What happens if one of us gets sick and we're down here vacationing uh, until May, forget it. We wanna be back home where our community is and where we know the hospital and where we feel safer. So instead of thinking about it, ruminating about it, they're making a decision. I want you to tell me what decision are you going to make today instead of questioning? And, um, Let's see, I'm going to my friend's house because it makes me feel bad saying no. Well, um, if that's a decision that you need to make, and I see all these people saying the stocks are, the shelves are already empty, then maybe what you need to do is ask for some help. One of the interesting things, and we're gonna send out a newsletter early this week with some links to free tools that you can use, is um, writing notes to your neighbor and building neighbors and building an email and a cell phone list. These are things that you can do. Um, another decision that you can do, just stay home. Another decision that you can do is, um, you know, uh, you could talk to your boss about uh, what your comfort level is. If you don't have the kind of job where you can work remotely and you need to go to work, Maybe now is the time to start reaching out for help in terms of childcare. But what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to sit and question. I don't want you to sit and ruminate. I don't want you to stay stuck thinking because that's going to make the fear worse. So today's piece of advice is stop asking questions and start making decisions. Okay. And I want you to tell me, what are you going to do? I see that somebody canceled their trip to Hawaii. I see that somebody has asked a neighbor for support to go and do the shopping for them. I see that somebody is finding it boring at home. You're right. It is boring at home if that's the attitude you bring to it. Um, 
I think being at home for two to three weeks and slowing down is a huge opportunity. And that's why it's so important for you to work on your mindset. Uh, I see that somebody's canceled their wedding. I see that uh, somebody has decided to get to Australia instead of staying in Thailand. I have somebody is arranging to work from home. Uh, somebody is using the time to take webinars, to listen to audiobooks. I see somebody is sending supplies to their parents. Um, I think that this is an opportunity. I see somebody else has canceled their wedding. I see somebody slowing down. Um, I see somebody that has decided to put uh, things on pause and to start to work on projects around the house. Yes, you can get through this. And you're going to get through this if we stay connected. Okay. And you're going to get through this if you ask for help, if you need it. And you're going to get through this if you keep your mindset positive, if you keep reminding yourself that you're okay. And if you come at this from a place of being centered from your heart and centered from your kindness and centered from your spirit. I see people starting to paint. I see people doing uh, cello lessons over FaceTime. I see people uh, working out in a home gym. I see people working on house projects. I see people doing self-care, catching up on reading. This is gonna pass. And the faster that you make decisions that are keeping you and your family safe, the faster that it will pass for you. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.